All right, we are gonna focus on coastal land uses, kind of a quickie uh, today. So it shouldn't take very long to go through this one, but it's an important thing as uh, about 60% of the US population lives uh, in proximity to coastal environments and therefore uh, face threats from coastal environments um, and need to consider how development impacts the coastal environment and the threats posed by uh, proximity to the coastal environment. So, um, well, can't really ask questions, but uh, the activity for this lecture is that I want you to come up with a list of potential hazards uh, that come from living along the coast and uh, some ideas on how to mitigate those threats. So, you know, hurricanes, well, you need to have good evacuation policies, things like that. Um, so what, what are the hazards that come from living on the coast and what do we do about them? So that's the activity for today. Just post them in Canvas. Uh, should be pretty straightforward. So about 39% of the U.S. population lives in counties directly on the coast. Um, so that's right in, you know, half beaches, basically. 14% uh, or, or 14 of our largest cities are on the coasts. And um, I think it's 60% of the population lives within like 100 miles of the coast or 50 miles of the coast. Something like that. So vulnerable to um, coastal hazards. Anyways, uh, 14 of the largest cities in the U.S. are on the coast, so certainly a hazard for those cities as we deal with things like rising, uh, rising sea levels, hurricanes, things like that. Oops, wrong way. Sorry. So some of the threats to coastal environments, uh, development, loss of wetlands are big ones. Wetlands serve as um, kind of big buffers and sponges for uh, coastal hazards. So when we have hurricanes, other storms, flooding events, those wetlands are major um, protection zones. So they actually can uh, minimize damage caused by uh, various sundry and assorted hazards, as well, of course, as providing uh, significant habitat and ecosystem services. So losing those wetlands is an enormous impact. And as we build, again, put more development in these vulnerable areas, we increase the risk to people and property because we're putting more stuff in harm's way. We're also seeing increased pollution and runoff. So again, as we build impervious surfaces, those increase pollution runoff. Uh, if you look at this graphic about Chesapeake Bay, this holds true for really any water body. But the main sources of nitrogen pollution in the Chesapeake Bay, agricultural runoff, air pollution, stormwater runoff, wastewater treatment of factories, and septic systems. So you can see the biggest one is ag runoff. That's also true in like the Great Lakes. Uh, these these uh, patterns of threats hold true across um, here into the Midwest. So it's not just the uh, Chesapeake Bay that deals with these hazards. It's also, you know, water bodies here in the Midwest as well. So certainly potential harm that comes from our development practices. And light and noise pollution are also a growing threat. So this story here is about how light pollution can actually impact turtles because what happens is when the baby turtles are born, uh, it's kind of a weird thing, but the, the stars and moonlight twinkling on the water is what attracts them to move towards the water, that reflection and that light. But because of development along the coastal environments, now we have bright lights on the shore. And so oftentimes the baby turtles get confused, go towards the light on the shore, as opposed to moving towards the water because they see the twinkles in the bright and they think that's the direction they're supposed to go. So certainly a challenge. Uh, many of our turtle populations are in decline, threatened and so forth. So, um, you know, the more we impact their reproduction, the more likelihood they are of going extinct down the line. Obviously, natural disasters are a threat. Um, again, as we build more and put more people in harm's way, they become more vulnerable. More people are vulnerable to natural hazards and those disasters. And um, we're also seeing, along with that, climate change and sea level rise. So there's a video here about king tides in Miami. And what's happening in Miami is that basically during high tide events, as sea levels rising in that area, they're actually seeing flooding in inland neighborhoods as those seawaters basically coming up the stormwater drainage system. 
and flooding neighborhoods far from the beach. Um, so their stormwater system that's supposed to move water out to the ocean in the event of thunderstorms is actually creating a pathway for uh, sea level to come up and clog up and flood these neighborhoods. So video is worth watching, talks about uh, kind of the process that's happening with that. And again, that's a, a factor they're having to deal with because sea level is rising in the Miami Beach area. So we do have some policies and, and regulations that have been put into effect to help mitigate uh, some of the damage to coastal environments through development. So the Coastal Zone Management Act passed in 1972 provides federal funding, guidelines, technical assistance for coastal areas in the Great Lakes states. So these are federal policies intended to help states mitigate harm from coastal development. Uh, it's funding and resources channeled through the states. So specific policies are actually developed and put into practice at the state and local level uh, with assistance from the federal government. Coastal Barrier Resources Act of 1982 um, actually limited federal funding for development on some barrier islands, recognizing the value that bar barrier islands play in protecting our coastal environments um, and serving as barriers to impacts from storms and so forth. Uh, there was a desire to protect and preserve those areas from future development, and so by restricting federal funds, that was seen as a way to preserve those lands. Also establish the barrier island system to protect and preserve those barrier islands from future development. And the Great Lakes, Great Lakes Program of 1972 was a partnership between the US government and Canada um, to protect the Great Lakes, recognizing that this is a valuable resource for both countries and that both countries have to coordinate and cooperate because the water uh, doesn't care what country it's in, it flows across boundaries, so pollution, other impacts are going to impact both countries and there needs to be cooperative development in that area. <clears throat> so it provided funding for new sewer treatment and other infrastructure to uh, mitigate some of the water pollution that was going into the Great Lakes and help clean them up. Uh, restored uh, restoration of land within the drainage basin again to mitigate uh, pollution and, and uh, runoff and so forth and helped to set policies to control invasive species. So again, bi-national cooperation um, to help manage a bi-national resource. So some policies and practices that can be put into place to help preserve coastal zones is to avoid development in the 100-year floodplain. Uh, this is actually policy that should be implemented everywhere, not just within uh, coastal zones, but uh, you don't want to build in the floodplain, that's a bad idea. You want to build into the existing patterns of development. So we've talked a lot about this, reducing sprawl, uh, reducing new impervious surface that gets built. So the more you contain the urban footprint, the more you contain impervious surfaces, the more you reduce runoff, the more you uh, protect uh, ecosystems and habitat and, and areas where stormwater can absorb, all of those things are going to benefit and reduce impacts on coastal environments. Design for walkability is going to make a huge impact on, again, impervious services, air quality, all of those things benefit from walkability. It also makes more dense development, so you're sprawling less, so positives there. Preserving wetlands and other ecological systems that buffer storms and flooding. Again, maintaining the natural environment in an unchanged way is important because the natural environment has evolved to deal with things like hurricanes and floods and stormwater and all of that. And it's only when we change it and build on it that it becomes um, a problem, right? Uh, ensuring access to these areas. Um, obviously, people are going to su be supportive of open space that they can actually hike and walk in and, and take advantage of. So um, if you want to get support for preserving open space, allowing people to access it and recreate in it is important. Uh, you want to think about your critical infrastructure and facilities. So um, put them in places that are out of high-risk high areas. So things like fire stations, hospitals, all of those things need to be built in a way to minimize their vulnerability to flooding and other natural hazards. Uh, other critical infrastructure as well, same deal, making sure it's, it's kept safe and protected. And green infrastructure is again using natural features and elements to um, provide protection from uh, hazards and storms and stuff. 
So Wisconsin coastal counties, uh, we do have a few up in the very north um, along the Great Lakes up there and then on the uh, east side of the state as well along Lake Michigan. So we do have counties that fall into uh, that are considered coastal. And uh, so in the 50s and 70s, there were massive floods prompted statewide action to try and minimize hazards from developments on the Great Lakes and to um, put in place regulations to promote more sustainable development um, on those coastal counties. Most much of the coastline is high bluffs prone to erosion and landslides during high water events. So they're vulnerable to uh, threats and building in that area needs to be done in a way that, that recognizes that hazard and is done appropriately. And the way that typically is done is through setbacks. And so there are standards in place to require any buildings, especially homes, to be built at least 75 feet back from the shoreline. Um, some places it may be further depending on local conditions. And um, <clears throat> to ensure the development is done in a way that's going to mitigate the harm from erosion. So Wisconsin Coastal Development Program is run out of the Department of Administration and there's a bunch of different uh, programs and partnerships and so forth that uh, is in place to help mitigate coastal development. So you can see they've got their strategic vision, the needs assessment and so forth. Uh, the new one's drafted right now. So if we look at that, uh, you can kind of see what the needs are along the coastal zone here. Um, you can see through the table of contents here, they have wetlands, coastal hazards, uh, public access, marine debris, impacts, management planning, uh, resources, so forth. So ensuring that um, there are policies and practices in place to um, ensure development along our coastal counties is sustainable. So local regulations provide uh, local control to reduce issues of erosion, pollution, and so forth. And so the link here is to, um, sorry, just uh, these are the state standards that, that cities have to meet. And um, this sets out um, how cities can adopt ordinances in line with state provisions, um, defines those counties that are impacted by those coastal regulations, and serves as a resource um, for understanding how development can occur in those counties. So certainly worth understanding if you want to live or develop in those areas. And they have setbacks, they have landscaping requirements to reduce erosion and filter runoff. So as development is occurring on these uh, coastal areas, we're trying to reduce the fertilizer, pesticides, other things that run off into the water to maintain water quality, septic system requirements to make sure that we're not um, polluting the water through that. And uh, there are some aesthetic purpose uh, restrictions as well. So making sure that we're maintaining the appearance of uh, the shoreline and we don't have ugly metal buildings, things like that, that are going to detract from the aesthetic uh, beauty of the area. And what we've seen over history is because water uh, initially was uh, the power source, right? So manufacturers were building along waterways to take advantage of water power to power their plants. Uh, then we had steam fired plants uh, with coal as the fuel. So we needed lots of water to run the steam engines. And uh, so what happened was in many of our uh, cities, the river fronts and shorelines were actually the industrial areas because they needed the water. And so cities were actually oftentimes um, separated from the waterfront by that industrial use. And so as industry has declined, manufacturing has declined, companies have gone out of business, uh, we're recognizing the opportunity to reconnect cities uh, with our waterfronts, recognizing the value of waterfront property and um, how that can be used for recreation space, uh, become a, a waterfront can actually be a community amenity. So there's a value in being connected to the waterfront and cities are, are moving to take down old factories, move highways and other infrastructure that's blocking access to um, those waterways. 
So uh, this is Baltimore. The inner harbor of Baltimore has been uh, transformed from kind of a gritty, rundown industrial area into a playground. There's an aquarium, a museum, lots of shopping, lots of residential developments. It's become um, a real tourist attraction. A very high-end development has gone down uh, over what had been a very you know rundown development. You can see the highway here that completely separated the rest of downtown from the waterfront that's been taken out now so you have access to this area um, making it a, a real city amenity as to what before had been a real eyesore in an area you wouldn't want to spend time it wasn't safe seattle's doing the same thing so seattle is working to uh, remove a highway and put in place <clears throat> what had been an elevated urban highway into a boulevard um, to let people connect to the waterfront. The Embarcadero in San Francisco is another example. They took out um, an elevated freeway after the 1989 uh, earthquake damaged it. Instead of rebuilding it, they took it out and reconnected downtown San Francisco to the waterfront, and now it's an enormous tourist attraction in San Francisco. So that's really all I've got. Uh, this video here, again, it's linked in the module. I would strongly encourage you to watch it. It's a good one. It talks about the challenges of coastal development in the Chesapeake Bay and the impact that development has on the water quality and the economics of the Chesapeake Bay. So uh, crab and uh, crab fishermen particularly have been really hard hit by pollution in the bay and so forth. And so there's a recognition that um, pollution doesn't just affect the ecosystems, it affects the economics as well. So definitely worth watching, checking out. Um, that's it for this one. It's a quickie, but y'all are going to hear enough of me that I think it's okay. Have a great day. <clears throat> oh, no.